Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think we might as well start now. We are this the time. Uh, so, welcoming you all to the uh, to our seminar series on clearing the, the sem this this talk on municipal solid waste as a source of air pollution is part of a seminar series uh, hosted in CPR called Clearing the Air Seminar Series on Delhi's Air Pollution. Uh, today we have uh, three panelists to talk about the solid to talk about solid waste. Um, first, we have uh, Ravi Agarwal, who is the founder director of Toxics Link. Uh, then we have Nalini Shekhar, who has come from Bangalore, and she's the co-founder of an organization called Hasiru Dala in Bangalore, which is quite well known in Bangalore, but most of us from Delhi may not know much about them. So we'll ask her when she speaks also to tell us a bit about the work of Hasiru Dala. And uh, finally, we have Dr. Seema Avasthi, who is a, who's an engineer and she's a specialist in solid waste management. And she is the founder and director of a consulting company called ICUC Consultants Private Limited. So anyway, without wasting any more time, I'll hand over now to Ravi, who will talk to us about the, he'll talk, to, he'll talk to us about the whole cycle of solid waste, what happens to the different streams of solid waste, and how they lead to, you know, where all combustion happens and how this leads to different kinds of exposure to pollutants with a focus on airborne pollutants. He'll also talk, I understand, a little bit about the pollution regulations and the various, the various standards and regulations that apply to solid waste. And, you know, something I think he'll throw some light on the politics of those regulations. And then we'll go on to the other panelists after. So over to you, Ravi. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, my, as I, as I just said, I'll, sorry. Uh, I'll start with our uh, organizational involvement with the idea of air pollution, because I want to give some insight into how these policies came about, how these processes are starting. Of course, now everybody's talking about air pollution. Uh, but there has been some history of our involvement with the idea of waste and air pollution. Uh, how do I start? Yeah, okay. So we've had a long history. Actually, we started from the issue of uh, air pollution uh, in 1994, close to when we started working. And it, our entry was looking at uh, dioxin emissions from medical waste incineration and the waste incineration per se. There was just that point uh, when uh, the Department of uh, Renewable Energy was formed, and uh, it was talking about a special emphasis on waste energy technologies around 1993. And there was also the Supreme Court order on you know, 50 bedded hospitals must have on site incineration. That's the time when we stepped in. We made a, a document called Be Careful with That Cure, a research document uh, looking at uh, the idea of emissions from incinerators uh, worldwide. And this was presented to the Supreme Court, and then uh, it led to the change of the dioxin and incident standards in, in, uh, in, uh, as part of the national legislation. And then subsequently, we've been working on mercury emissions in 2001, lead and heavy metal emissions in 2013, and ash issues, what happens when you, when you burn the, uh, when you finish combusting something. So our entry uh, into this was through, through pollutants, air pollutants. And uh, the report on the left actually was the report we referred to a lot because very early days, dioxin was not a n word known in, uh, by anybody. Uh, it was something which was introduced to a national campaign. Uh, but one of the key documents was this uh, health assessment document of dioxins, which is a draft document of the US EPA, which came out in 1994 and late, later came out as the final document. But this had excellent data on uh, both on source emissions uh, also in percentage of emissions of dioxins from insulation and medical waste insulation. So uh, this was the key science, scientific document which beca became the basis of uh, uh, the campaign. Um, and uh, the resultant uh, result was this 1998 uh, biomedical waste rules. And if you see that it did two things that rules because an outcome of the campaign was it segregated the waste into different technology categories. And this was completely due with the kind of emissions which these technologies uh, emit. And the second was, it's probably the only law in the world, insulation law in the world, which still stands that uh, the uh, uh, insulation of, uh, of uh, chlorinated, uh, uh, chlorine-treated waste is prohibited, both in medical waste and in municipal waste. I don't think there's any other standard like that. And the reason was that we wanted to avoid the dioxin standard, very, very expensive to, to maintain and to regulate. 
and to go down the preventive uh, route. And uh, uh, now coming down to how this, this is really one of the problems is how, what's the source, uh, how much source appropriation can you do to uh, municipal waste. Uh, there's not so much data out there. This data report you must have seen in the last few days. A very well-known report is quoted everywhere. Uh, it's um, uh, IIT Kanpur um, Sharma and uh, Dixit report. And uh, you may already have seen these three figures uh, of the percentage. Overall, what it says is that uh, it's about uh, the uh, that it makes a statement that the contribution of uh, of MSW burning is talking of open burning, not of incineration. Uh, is surprising, could surprise many people, and attributes about 89% on PM10 and PM2.5. What it doesn't do, what no studies do, is look at other installations, uh, other emissions, because as you know, waste is a very complex material, and uh, you cannot just limit yourself to uh, only uh, PM10, the classic pollutants of SOX, NOX, and PM10, PM2.5. Uh, the second point I want to make is about the complexity of the waste stream. This is uh, a policy brief from a, a study, inter-organizational study we did over some time, looking at uh, the main principles uh, which underlie uh, waste management as a, as a, as a policy um, uh, sort of support document. And uh, it says there that the waste flows are far more complex than official recognition of the formal system. And this, it, this diagram will show you a bit of that, that from the point the waste is generated and to the point where it's, it's supposedly disposed, there are many, many cycles uh, which go on. There are many places where waste is, uh, is uh, diverted, it's handled, and could also be uh, combusted. Uh, and um, if you look at the standards, the standards are only for end-of-the-pipe technology standards. We almost have, uh, th so this part is not recognized, except in the last municipal waste rules of 2016, there's been some recognition of this in a very, very sort of uh, uh, abstract kind of way, uh, but not this, 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 this complex stream is not recognized. And it's very important to recognize this complex stream uh, because no matter what the aspirational uh, you know, decongestion of this might be in the future, currently and for some time to come, this will certainly uh, be. And this is done uh, by uh, the, what we call popularly as the, as the informal sector, uh, but also there's a, there's, a, there's a continuous gradation between the formal and the informal sector, what we classically call the class, formal and informal sector. So you see things like this happening everywhere. And uh, there have been some studies which are not in the public realm. GIZ did a study on emissions of dioxins from waste burning. Uh, they haven't released it because the results were, I believe, quite disastrous. And it was done with the government. Uh, so this is a, this is a burning of BBC coated copper wire to get the copper. And of course now we're saying, okay, don't, let's talk only MSW, but MSW and other waste streams are quite mixed up in a sense of how, who handles it, how it's handled. So we have different waste streams formally, but uh, actually uh, the segregations are improving, but they're not so good as yet. Uh, this is something you see uh, open burning everywhere or you see uh, in waste landfills, and I have a picture of that too. Uh, this is this is a slide to show the uh, recognition of the informal waste collector and the waste picker in the new 2016 rule. It was for those who were engaged with this. It was a very big battle because just to acknowledge the fact that something called informal in a formal legislation, or there's something called waste picker who's not identified uh, as an entity, uh, was something. Um, I think it was. Uh, from the 2000 rules, the 2016 rules, it was recognition of the fact that if you don't recognize this, you have no way ahead and you cannot really come up with any workable system. Uh, this is something you see on, on the landfills. If you have to go to any landfill, you will find uh, the simmering, uh, burning, be primarily because of high uh, temperature in the waste heaps. And uh, there are aspirational uh, campaigns which happen all the time. Uh, uh, such as burning of leaves, etc., which is, uh, a, I, I think, a very high source of particulate matter. Uh, but the systems to, uh, to support them are lacking. Uh, now, I'll just quickly uh, show you that uh, even in, in uh, all the waste laws have been revised as in 2016. So if you go to the website, you'll find the latest revisions. They have been sort of made more practical. Some of them, some of them have been diluted a bit. Uh, this is the 
biomedical waste law and the insulator standard. So in the insulation standard, uh, there has, there's a whole document out there which tells you how to put it, how to make it. It's a very detailed engineering document. And that is because the first draft of this came out in 1999, 2000. And uh, over the last 16 years, uh, there have been many facilities of biomedical waste which have come up in the country. And they have uh, sort of, uh, so this, this is a learning experience through which these new standards have come by. The specific case I want to point towards, which is an interesting policy case as well, uh, policy process case, is the Sukhdev Bihar insulator, which is, which is called the Okhla Temarpur insulator. And the picture you see is actually from the web, but shows the citizens of Sukhdev Bihar protesting on that. Uh, and uh, there were several things happening at the same time. And I got pulled into some of these discussions, both at the government and the, uh, and the community level. Uh, there was a big push in the budget for incineration. So Mr. Chidambaram's last budget had a big subsidy for incineration. And when there was a big hue and cry, this uh, Kasturi Rangan committee was formed, the task force of the waste to energy, uh, uh, which does not recognize the emission problem to any great degree. So it's really about, it's, it's a document which says how to do it, but does not recognize the problems or the cost of doing it. And simultaneously, there was a report of the Technical Experts Evaluation Committee, which I was invited to be part of, on the Timarpur Okla Waste Energy Plant. And when we evaluated the project uh, in the Central Pollution Board, we found out that the DPR, the detailed project report, had nothing to do with the final project, which was on the ground. Uh, there were two components of the DPR talking of both the Timarpur uh, uh, plant to make the what they call the refuse ribbon uh, pellets. Uh, uh, fueled RDF, and that was to be to be in, to be incinerated, but this never happened. And what they put up was a mass incineration plant. And when we came to the question of emissions, they said we'll do it later. So it was a complete, it's a very strange process of a project of size of 200 to 300 crores being passed, uh, with actually no environmental approvals on it. And that became the basis of uh, the uh, the fight of the community, which unfortunately didn't go off uh, exactly what the way they want. It's very hard to uh, take away projects which are already installed. Uh, this, uh, this table is from the 2016 uh, municipal rules. And the first time in the municipal waste rules, we have an incinerator standard. And uh, it, uh, it deals with all the classical noxes, but also deals with something you see there called total dioxin furons, which is 0.1 nanogram T. Uh, uh, toxic equivalent or TQ per, per nanometer cube. Essentially, this is the European standard. And if you talk to the European uh, regulators, they'll tell you we took 50 years to get to the standard. Getting this, making a standard is very easy, but getting the skills and the equipment and the regulatory quality for the standard takes a fair amount of time. It takes a lot of skill building and equipment building on the ground. We don't have any of this. So we have a point one. Uh, nanogram uh, TEQ standard, but we have almost no ability at the moment to, en to, uh, to uh, ensure the standard. And everybody gives the, the, the uh, reason, uh, the, the image of these large insulators in the middle of Zurich and, and, and Amsterdam. Those insulators are about 500 million euros each. And they cost a fair amount of the city's budget, and they're very, very heavily regulated. So without the ability to regulate these standards, these standards are just an entry point into anybody who can claim the standard. There have been, uh, in the report and in the, in the uh, NGT judgment also, which followed the community intervention, there were talks about putting online monitoring systems and all that. Nothing of that sort has happened. Uh, this is this uh, standard. I have marked out the yellow, the highlighted, just to show that the uh, idea of no, no chlorine-based uh, waste being insulated continues to be. And of course, those of you who are chemists or have a science background know that chlorine is a precursor to dioxin production. So, and dioxin, just to tell you, dioxin is, is one of the most toxic uh, unintended byproducts of combustion uh, known to man. It is toxic in very, very uh, minute and minuscule quantities. It's the number one pollutant which has led standard across the world for all combustion. So it's the key, key, key pollutant which has led the cost of insulation high and the standards are very ex extremely important uh, pollutants. It's a pop, that means it goes into the body system. Uh, incidentally, India has one of the highest um, 
um, uh, body uh, weight of uh, uh, or the infusion of uh, diacetyl-like compounds in breast milk, even though our insulation is very low. So we have a very high uh, diacetyl exposure, which is not recognized as yet. So just to come to the final two slides, uh, just to wrap up, uh, uh, the, there are many dis dispersed sources of air emission impacts from waste, sorry, that should be waste, which are not recognized, which are not measured, uh, and it is not recognized, the complexity of the waste stream flow is not recognized, we're only looking at end of pipe, landfill, disposal, and somehow the approach that waste disposal is more important than air emissions runs through, through the establishment, that somehow we should get rid of the waste, we'll look at the emissions later. So all the insulators being built, the two second ones being built, there is no information available on what is the technology they're using, what is the filtration system they're using, uh, where will the filtration system go after it's been used. For example, if you use a baghouse filter or use a carbon injected filter, what, what will happen to that because it's hazardous waste? Um, there's a rush to install high cost technologies. Many municipalities are bidding for them. They don't understand uh, the, uh, the technology. They don't understand the regulatory or the operational ecosystems. And the siting, siting is very, very important. So we, we take the standard and we assume that the standard will be met. There is no real emphasis on incentives to alternatives and cleaner ways of waste disposal. This has been talked about for a long time. In the new Swatch Bharat, they're talking about composting. But uh, it's, in terms of actual implementation, and maybe Seema can uh, talk better about this, there are very few such examples. Uh, of that, and there's several bottlenecks uh, on that. Uh, standard making, we should have no doubt about that. I'm sure all of you who are part, who have participated in standard making know that it is a semi-political, semi-science-based process. All our standards are health-based standards, but what does that mean? Uh, so uh, if, if you even go to the basis of how these health-based health uh, standards have come, they are, they, there's a complex procedure of looking at best available technology, best um, achievable technology. So it's very much linked with, not always with health data, but also with what is achievable, in a sense. So they are good on paper. Uh, waste emissions are heavily regulated elsewhere. Uh, I just said uh, we are not, we don't have the capacity to do that. And as we know, uh, there's no credible primary study in actual emissions of waste or the impacts on health. The impacts on health studies we don't have across the board uh, because they are expensive studies. Of, one classic study which is quoted by everyone is the study done aims, in AIMS on, on uh, lead, in, uh, lead uh, exposures of children uh, because of air pollution. But that was done at least 10 or 15 years back. Thank you. Thanks. Take Nalini after this and then. So, yeah, thanks for this. Oh, you don't need yeah. it. Thanks very much. If you turn the mic towards you, Nalini, though. Yeah. yeah. So thanks for this, uh, Ravi, and uh, this was excellent. Uh, Nalini is now going to, I mean, we understand from, you, uh, you know, uh, Dalia, I understand that most of the work of Hasiru Dala and your organization and the many organizations you work with is focused on the waste pickers the, or the informal workers and their kind of integration into their role in the waste, in the management of waste stream and their integration in the waste system. But you also have, I mean, it's not just a small intervention. You have a massive partnership with the BBMP, that's the Bangalore Municipal Corporation. And, uh, you know, the potential this has for intervening in this complex, you know, very, very complex management of, you know, thousands of different types of waste and the, you know, various complex issues it poses for recycling and safe management and disposal. Um, I'll hand over to you now, but I mean, just briefly, we understand from Nalini and from the, you know, the material of Hasiru Dala, that the, what they've achieved is something like 50% of the households in Bangalore are now composting their waste, which is, you know, and board-wise, across wards, across the city. Uh, she told me, you know, just before this talk, she told me that no ward in Bangalore has less than even the poorly performing wards have about 25% composting happening, which is a massive achievement. And, you know, it requires a lot of active collaboration between civil society and the state and various technical experts to achieve this type of, you know, city scale. That's why we've called her from Bangalore to Delhi to, you know, to tell us a little bit about the, you know, exciting things that are happening on, in this space in Bangalore. So, yeah, over to you. Thank you. I just want to correct. It's about not composting 50%, segregation 50%. Segregation 50%. So, uh, Hasrudala in Kannada means green force, and uh, we work with informal waste pickers, and uh, uh, 
ways because I've been filling the gap for inefficiency of the state to provide uh, waste management services. So we, uh, first of all, we work for the recognition of their contribution, and we have done a study which has shown 1,050 tons of waste is managed by waste pickers in Bangalore alone, which is saving about uh, 84 crores per annum for the city. So if that is so, without any uh, outflow of any kind of, um, um, you know, money from the government, if they are benefiting, they should be recognized. That was where we started our first. And uh, Bangalore City gave an identity card, occupational ID card, with the logo of the city and signature of the, uh, of the commissioner, which was identical to that of a mayor of the city. So that was the first to work we did. And now, of course, it resulted in 2016 uh, law, which uh, talks about recognition and giving identity card to waste pickers. And waste pickers we see as an extremely skilled labor. And how do we utilize them the way we want? Some of the things we did was after kind of uh, organizing them, I'm specifically looking at sharing with you all the air pollution related stuff. And uh, one of the things, a big campaign we did among the waste picker is no burning of waste. That was our first campaign. And with that, we started with a campaign of no child labor. So both went in hand in hand. And uh, we have stopped burning of the waste, I would say no. Have we achieved at least about 80% of it? I yes, say yes. So within the city, the farmer's city, like the, the core of the city, you will not find waste burned by the waste picker. The burning actually happens with the sanitary workers. So that is another thing that we are looking at changing. And outskirts of the city, we still... Distinction, by the way, I think just to clarify, the sanitary workers means the municipal, municipal workers. Municipal workers. And when you say waste pickers, you mean the informal, informal workers. workers. Yes. So, um, um, and we are looking at how to do it. And Bangalore, with the participation of a lot of citizens, this is the first city probably the workers' organization and environmentalists together worked. That's why so much of changes have come together. Otherwise, generally, we are at log loggerheads of what is good for labor, what is good for environment. That debate goes on. So, <coughs> that was first. And we pushed the government to provide the infrastructure. Every ward is supposed to have something called dry waste collection center, which is nothing but an aggregation of all the, uh, you know, non-organic waste, that is paper, plastic, whether it's recyclable, non-recyclable, everything comes into this center. And uh, we successfully uh, done it. And our whole idea, it was not just Hasrudala. There's another group called Solid Waste Management Roundtable, which is a citizen group. We both worked at it. Well, the idea was citizen group, but who will run it? How do you run it? That is, came from the labor themselves. And uh, to tell the story short, in six years, today, all the dry waste collection centers um, are managed by waste pickers. The city actually makes an MOU with, this, uh, with uh, the waste picker, first time again in, in, in India, probably. And also, the collection of dry waste happens twice a week in a ward with waste picker. So the collection system of uh, different stream goes to different people. Because when people segregated, the common complaint was that they are mixing the waste when they are taking. So we have two different uh, streams. Uh, waste picker uh, is given a work order in their own name to collect dry waste. And the wet waste is collected at this point of time by the co contractors. Yesterday, just commissioner announced that uh, even the uh, wet waste, that is organic waste, will be collected by uh, people who are collecting now, but they will own their own vehicle and they will do it. So the work order will be directly to them. So, so Bangalore is the first city which looked at three waste segregation. One is uh, wet waste, that is organic waste. Second is dry waste. And the third is uh, sanitary waste. Sanitary waste included, or the reject waste, we call it in general term, which includes sanitary waste. Um, this um, uh, sanitary napkins and diapers and catheters and injections that you use at home, everything is collected separately. And that was totally contribution of uh, Hasrudala because we knew that this is not good for the workers. So we pushed for that in 2011. We have not achieved 100%, but we there is a recognition for the third category uh, uh, of waste that is collected. And while collecting, it is considered as municipal solid waste while disposing it is considered as biomedical waste. 
So there is a uh, there is a different theories why we have done that, and we can discuss it if people are interested. That is one part, and the second is the reduction of waste is also very important. So Karnataka is the first state to pass a legislation on one-time use of plastic. So there was a lot of discussion between the citizens and waste pickers because the more waste you get, you get money. The citizen said, "We don't want to do." One of the waste pickers stood up and said, which all the other waste pickers supported, and said, "If it is a question of public health and our livelihood, we give up. We are more concerned about the public health." So uh, when that happened, and today the ban has been quite successful, I would say. If you come and see in Bangalore, you might see still uh, paper plastic on the street in some areas where there is no citizen participation. Where there is citizen participation, you don't see. In some of the wards, you will see people going with saris to, you know, pick up, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, vegetables from the street vendor if they've forgotten to take a. you know um, or a helmet if they forgotten to take a bag and if you look at the packaging that is happening in the hotels it's a huge difference even mcdonald today doesn't serve straws and doesn't serve the lid i thought it is across it has changed it is not changed it's only in bangalore which has changed the food that you get is all by we don't get any thermocol material or i wish i see a lot in bang in uh, delhi we don't see that that is replaced by the sugar cane bagasse so the packaging from the restaurants have changed and all big restaurants have to do their composting within their own complexes that has happened and the city has decided the bulk waste generator that is people who have who live together that is more than 50 households in an apartment or if you generate more than 10 kg of organic waste you become a bulk generator you have to manage your own waste that is about 40% of city's waste so that kind of help and that is the space we have integrated waste pickers today uh, waste pickers we manage only 33 drivers collection center so every day people um, attend to about 4 and a half lakh homes collecting seg source segregated dry waste so when the drivers comes to drivers collection center 80% of the waste that comes cannot be recycled and uh, that is a huge problem we have so in the last uh, couple of months with just 27 wards 543 tons of non recyclable we have sent to acc cement where for co processing is it correct to do it i don't think it's the best way to do it that's the only thing we have right now and uh, the best way is to change the packaging itself and the consumption pattern they actually uh, shred it and use it in the place of coal oh, as fuel as fuel <coughs> so the law allows it 2016 so uh, what we have achieved in bangalore is the waste stream management and not just waste management wet waste we have a different kind of processing dry waste we have a different waste reject waste we have a different waste garden waste we have a different kind of waste and hazardous waste and cnd is still not great but it is moving towards that one of the things is uh, the city has decided the dry leaves we have lot of trees in city it's uh, declining but still we have so the leaf litter and dry waste doesn't leave the world now we have another court here uh, court uh, director which says even wet wet waste that is the rest of the waste should also be managed within the world and uh, the ward committees have been charged uh, uh, with the um, you know function of making this happen so uh, the waste pickers we have trained them to do composting that has given them lot of jobs we have created more than 900 jobs in the last 5 uh, uh, years and also um, what we have really done is eco friendly events whether it is a wedding or a marathon or a conference we provide eco friendly um, uh, uh, events and we provide the waste management first of all we work with the host to see how they can reduce the quantum of waste that can be generated what kind of utensils will be used and then we work towards uh, getting them i mean there's lot of plate banks have started in bangalore so that there is no one time disposable uh, is used and uh, we have trained people to use uh, eco friendly washer washing material that is made out of citrus peels 
and most of our weddings where we do we also use that the material to clean up the uh, place um, so uh, so there is a lot of consumption of this one time plastic has come down even in an, our own dry waste collection centers actually we have to look at the st statistics and do a paper we have seen in 2014 what we did and the kind of material that are coming today to dry waste collection center is a huge difference so that shows there is Uh, collection is happening and also the segregation is happening and uh, hasrudala also has a for profit uh, hasrudala innovation is a for profit company which service about 33000 households every day which is bulk generators when we started our process 310 gram per household per day was the reject waste and today it is we started at the last year it was 105 and today it is 95 grams it is not that consumption has changed and people have changed it is only that the segregation is better how we do it is also because of our uh, the cost you know finally it touches your pocket if you create more uh, waste that cannot that is not easily reject that is not easily recyclable or it goes to processing that we charge very heavily what they give us as a compost what can be composted or sent to biogas that we charge less so even that system has really helped uh, helped us to do it so waste pickers we really look at them as a um, uh, the the labor force skilled labor force that is essential and also waste pickers are entrepreneurs so looking at the entrepreneurial spirit of waste pickers we have created all our uh, uh, you know intervention based on how actually they can work towards it so uh, 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 yeah Uh, so uh, the i mean the, the the place of segregation there are many reasons to segregate uh, uh, what, uh, fr you know from the air pollution perspective the place of segregation is that it makes everything else more manageable however you know you have to start you know you have to start small in the sense you know even at the even at the type of scale you have the potential for its you know the potential for its measurable impact on air pollution is a long term potential correct and uh, so how would you forecast that or what you know in what way do you think that can be uh, you know part of the what in what way is it currently part of the narrative and in you know in the narrative of the work that you do and the work that bbmp is doing in what way is it part of the narrative and what is its future potential in the way of you know upscaling mainstreaming taking it to other places it links to the i don't think we have a baseline data yet right. so and it's not been part of our narrative either mm -hmm. the only thing we know that 500 plus uh, you know non recyclable waste that has gone to acc otherwise would have been burnt mm -hmm. other than that we don't have so air pollution itself the lot of work has been done with air pollution with the lakes mm -hmm. in bangalore with uh, with the landfills in bangalore but not necessarily this particular probably that is something that can, you can help us take it up to uh, up to do it but uh, i feel that if 198 uh, wards every ward produces 4.5 tons of non recyclable waste per month per ward at a collection efficiency of 60% okay so what does it contain you will be surprised 1 ton of chappals which is 100 rupees which cannot be done you can't do anything around 1 ton of your um your the multilayered plastic which is your chip packets and the biscuit packets and all that and the beds which cannot be uh, recycled many of the bed clothes especially women clothes which which has a lot of mixture in it we don't know what it has okay if it's pure cotton definitely it can be recycled but not the others so these uh, and then the absolutely broken furniture these are the five item we take it to acc cement we are also very strict what goes there and what doesn't go to the extent possible we see wh what are the different kinds of um, you know material that can be recycled reprocessed when all the uh, the disposable uh, one time use of plastic stop the people didn't earn so much so we started collecting uh, coconut shells we eat a lot of coconut in bangalore today about 500 kilos of coconut shells is collected by dry waste collection center per week this was going to landfill we started giving it to different people to use as a fuel as soon as the volume increased last year we were asked for value added tax okay 
So the quantities when you really collect it and make it a huge quantity, then there is a market to do something about it. What is required for that is the infrastructure. VBMP has really delivered giving us dry waste collection center. This is within two years they have constructed 180 dry waste collection center. It is not in the best of its uh, shape and infrastructure, but at least there is a place where we can collect. So infrastructure is, is important. Citizen participation for segregation is very important. If citizens don't participate, the enforcement should come in. There is uh, enforcement, uh, I mean, there are people who have been fined uh, at the individual household level as well as commercial level uh, for uh, non-segregation. And the plastic ban is in force and the labor. So all these are very important to kind of achieve what we have achieved today. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nalini. And uh, now we'll hand over to Seema, who will talk. Uh, who will uh, who will talk to us about the technology? You know, she'll tell, take us through the main technologies and the approaches for dealing with municipal solid waste. More specifically, she'll also talk about the issue of dump sites. You know, the, the challenges that dump sites pose to us at the moment, and you know what can be done. You know, the current problem is dump sites. In you know, in terms of you know the most major problem from an air pollution perspective and from many other perspectives is the dump site. What can be done about to fix this current dump site problem? <coughs> I've also asked her to tell us a bit about, you know, from her experience of many years and many cities, what can be done, what should have been done, you know, approaches that worked, approaches that didn't work so successfully, and uh, also about the standards and regulations and how the applicable standards and regulations affect the choices that are being made between different approaches. So I think there's some problem, but hopefully, uh, are you being able to find your slides? Uh, Seema, uh, I think it's Disha, will you side. help? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Seema here, and uh, I am here to talk about the municipal solid waste and its impact on not only air pollution, but it is actually becoming more and more urban nuisance for all of us. Now, uh, is this working? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. So basically, you can see in this picture that uh, with the rapid urbanization, what has happened that uh, the our with the change in our uh, lifestyles also, we are generating more and more waste. And uh, uh, many years ago, I mean, up till last uh, many decades, we were not able to look into the issues related to solid waste management because the quantum were not so high. Now, because of the change in our lifestyle and because of increase in our population, now the and because of rapid urbanization, now more and more waste is being generated. And ironically, the city governments, they are responsible for managing, managing the municipal solid waste, and they're not able to handle it properly. And the result is you could see it in the form of the waste lying here and there all around the city, and also in the form of the dump sites, which you would find almost in every city now. So basically, what is the quantum of waste which we are generating? India itself is generating nearly 70 million tons of waste annually. This is huge quantum of waste. And if you look at the figure for the top 10 cities which are generating waste in India, you would see that uh, Kolkata and Mumbai and Delhi are generating more than 10,000 tons of waste. This is huge quantity. And then there are other cities which are generating in the range of 2,000 to 6,000. And other than these cities, there are so many other cities which are generating waste in the range of, you would say, 50 tons, 100 tons, 200 tons, 500 tons. So how are we managing these wastes? You can see that in the bigger cities, the problems are even bigger because of the land, land availability issues and because of the management uh, issues with the city government to handle the waste. Now, if we look at the ideal solid waste management system, we have solid waste management rules which were uh, framed in the year 2000. And then they were again revised in the year 2016. 
and the rules they state that the system which should be there as per the rules is that you should have a door to door collection system where the waste is to be uh, stored by the generator in a segregated manner when we say segregated manner as nalini pointed out it's like it should be stored in separate bins as dry waste wet waste and then there is domestic hazardous waste the sanitary waste which nalini said and the responsibility to collect that waste from the households or from the generator lies with the urban local body the city government they have to provide a system to collect the waste from door to door from the households now the bulk generators it has been uh, now mentioned in the rules 2016 that the bulk generators they have to take care of their waste on their own but still for the households and for the small commercial units it has to be done by the city government then this waste is taken in smaller vehicles by the waste pickers or waste collectors or sanitary uh, workers depending upon the kind of system the city has to the either community bins or dhalas or the places where we call them primary collection center where the waste is unloaded now in this in this uh, chain of event where the waste is collected by these waste collectors they have their own system of segregation of waste and picking up the recyclable material out of it and that's where we call them as an informal sector so around uh, the studies have indicated that around 15 to 20% of the waste it never reaches the final point of its destination and all thanks to our waste pickers because they have been informally doing it now from the primary uh, collection point the waste is if it is a big city then it is compacted in transfer stations or there are big vehicles which take the waste to the processing facility now when we uh, talk about the processing facility then it is basically the rules they state that uh, the kind of waste which we have it has lot of organic content in it it has recyclable content in it and some kind of dry waste which has high calorific value so such kind of waste should not be put into the landfill it should not be dumped or disposed and it has to be reused or recycled or processed to find to produce some kind of end product which uh, which may have its useful usefulness to the society so that's why we should be having the processing facility now mind it this is all i'm talking about the ideal system which we should have in our cities to manage the waste and then the rejects all the products which have no use of any kind which are which may be termed as the inert or the rejects from the processing facility or any kind of product which has got no usefulness that is to be finally disposed of in a landfill and this landfill is not to be a dump site it has to be a scientific landfill where it should be in the form of an impervious liner with the scope for cover it at the later stage once the cell is full so that the waste which is confined in that chamber or in that pit is not exposed to the environment at all so this is the entire system of events which happens in an ideal solid waste management system now along with this there are many other ways and methods which we are trying to do in order to make the system more efficient and more sustainable which is like moving towards 3r system 3r is reduce reuse and recycle as nalini pointed out that uh, in bangalore they in the last 2 3 years they have tried they have come up to the level where the waste generation is reduced from 300 grams to 150 gram per capita i would say this is a very big achievement because and it has direct link to our air pollution as well because all the waste which is being generated is going to either the is it's going to the dump site where its end uh, which it is facing is in the form of either decomposing on its own producing the landfill gas and then or it is burned so if you are able to reduce your waste at source that means you are able to get rid of that waste to come into the landfill and not facing the end of creating any kind of pollutant through burning or incineration then uh, we are also trying to come up with something called zero landfilling what if you are no, if nothing goes into the landfill so trying to find out various technologies and methods for processing of waste where every each and every component of municipal solid waste is processed and handled and nothing goes into the landfill why this concept is being worked out these days because of the issues uh, related to the land availability as we all know that in places like delhi we have been trying so hard to have some kind of alternative site 
so that uh, the these huge dump sites which we have in Delhi at Ghazipur, Okhla and Bhalaswa, they could be closed. But unfortunately, land is a big issue here. So there are many technologies which which claim that uh, they they can process the waste in such a manner so that nothing uh, can be disposed of in the landfill. Then there are smaller cities or towns which are not able to uh, have, which are not able to invest into creation of the big infrastructure like scientific landfill or the processing facilities. So what to do with them? Because Delhi and Bangalore or Kolkata is on one end. Bhopal, Gwalior, Indore, they are also on one end, which are generating waste in the range of, say, any city which is generating waste more than 200 tons or 300 tons, they, are, they have sufficient, I would say, budget to create infrastructure for them and they are able to find some solution for their waste. But what about the smaller towns and smaller cities which are generating waste in the range of 20 tons, 30 tons, 40 tons? They do not have adequate facilities to create the infrastructure as well as this kind of system cannot work very optimal economically for them. So for that, there is a regional concept which has been introduced uh, by... Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you a question at this point? Uh, I mean, you know, it's quite, it's quite technical and it's quite complex, but if in very simple words you can explain to us, what is the land, you know, why do, why, why do landfills burn? And what are the ways in which the landfill issue, you know, how, you know, what happens in the landfill? Yeah, I'll wait and say the so I'll, I'll answer your question yeah. first. See what happens that when the waste is dumped in this disposal site, so this is so the what's the difference scenario. between scientific and non-scientific okay. landfilling? So I'll just come to that in my, uh, okay, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you. Sure. See, scientific landfill is the landfill where, as I just mentioned, that you create an infrastructure or a cell, you do the excavation, you create a pit, and then you put a liner kind of system in the bottom on the sides of it so that and it's like enclosed container kind of system where you are putting your rejects, not your all kind of or mixed waste. Mm -hmm. You are supposed to put only rejects into that system and so that in future, in case of any small component of organic matter into it, if it gets decomposed and it produces any kind of leachate, which is like wastewater or any kind of contamination which is generated from there, does not percolate into the ground or onto the side of it or uh, then it has to be covered on daily basis with the soil cover, which is like 15 centimeter soil cover is to be put on it once you put the rejects uh, on in your landfill on daily basis and then you put the soil cover over it. So that during the rainfall or during any kind of such incident, the waste is not directly exposed to the environment. And once the cell is full, then it is to be covered or closed in a proper manner where again you put an impervious layer, layer over it which is primarily in the form of clay and then there are liners, HDPE liners, high density polyethylene liners which have got very long life cycle and then on the top of it you put the soil cover and the green grass cover. Uh, you can see if you have been to Delhi and uh, at Ghazipur side, so there you can see one part of it has been uh, done in a scientific method and closed by Gas Authority of India Limited as a pilot project where they have tried to capture landfill gas out of the dump site. And there they have done the proper closure. So when you look at it from the outside, you basically look at some kind of you know green landscaped area. That is what you find out once the scientific landfill is properly closed. That is unscientific landfill. Unscientific is, is a dump do? site. You just find out any low-lying area. Yeah. No, but uh, how, why do they burn the unscientific landfills? Why are they always on fire? Actually, they are not always on fire on their own. <laughs> this is something which uh, I can mention is that, see, there are two or three reasons why the waste burn over there. One reason is that because you have organic component which is in the waste and in due course of time because it is not exposed to the air, so in absence of air, the automatic decomposition which is anaerobic decomposition takes place and the end product of that is landfill gas which is methane and carbon dioxide. Now methane has got very high caloric value. Now in some kind of stray incident where some rack picker is moving around the dump site and is trying to you know collect some kind of useful product mainly metal out of it or they are just smoking or informally doing something and as soon as it gets ignited it catches fire that is one reason if you have open access to your dump site 
you would automatically find lot of burning incidents taking place because of the rat paper number one number two during uh, some kind of environmental conditions when you have very high temperature you have mm -hmm. high humid content also and there are some pockets of landfill gas which are captured inside the waste and they also the the condition is created in such a manner that it automatically catches fire sure. and then it spreads all, all across the dump mm -hmm. site. That is another reason. Third is, in some of the cases, when a municipality does not have any alternates for dumping of its waste, mm -hmm. then how will it reduce the quantum of waste in that dump site? So this is another solution to reduce the volume of the waste on your dump site. And this is a very common phenomena in smaller cities and towns all across the country. Not only in India, but in most of the developing nations, uh, this is the quick, uh, you know, uh, quick reduction, volume reduction of the waste, where you burn your waste, and uh, you again get your land to dump your waste. Now, in terms of the treatment options, these are various technologies which are available at the moment to treat the waste, because you have to process it as per the rules requirements. And you cannot put your organic matter and your dry waste, which is high calorific value, into the landfill. So you may do biomethanation, which is primarily for wet waste. You may do incineration, which is which can be done for mixed waste and for dry waste in itself. There are various technologies for that. Then you have this refuse derived fuel method, which is a physical processing method, which is primarily used for dry waste. You can use it for wet waste as well, because in this process, you basically segregate the waste and you dry it. You use the dryers and then you densify it and you put it in the form of pallets and use it as a fuel. And then recycling is uh, where uh, you have from the dry waste where you can recycle and you can recover the product. And then the windrow composting. Now in, in, in India, uh, in the last decade, the windrow composting was promoted like anything by government of India, especially when the JNN URM mission was uh, launched. And each and every city was uh, encouraged to use window composting method to process their organic content of waste. And uh, as Ravi also mentioned in his uh, presentation, that in 2014 onward, the government of India, they shifted their focus towards the waste to energy option, which is mostly either it could be in the form of biomethanation or it could also be in the form of incineration. Their main focus is on incineration which is, I would say, is maybe because of the reason that uh, this is when you have to handle huge quantum of waste and in terms of intro composting, your end product is the compost. And now if you have to use that compost because end product has to be utilized. So when you're trying to use the compost, it has to meet the, uh, the it has to comply with the requirements of the compost composting standards. And somehow, uh, the compost plants which we have in India, all across the country, many of the compost plants, they faced this issue of not meeting the standards for using that compost for agricultural purposes. And that's why they could not utilize that compost. And that's why these compost plants could not be run successfully by the private operators. They could not earn the revenue. So uh, recently, last year, Government of India, they came up with this uh, proposition and uh, the circular is already out where rupees 1500 per ton of subsidy is to be provided for running the compost plant. This is just to promote the windrow, to promote the composting uh, at the private level. But at the same time, waste to energy is also promoted in a big way because of the simple fact that it can handle huge quantum of waste in smaller area and you can get, well, you know, immediate reduction in the volume of the waste because you get only 15 to 20 percent of rejects if you are burning the mixed waste there. This was all about the, you know, what the system should be. Now, if you look into the actual system which is there in our country, then the waste which we are generated, hardly 70 to 80 percent of waste is actually being collected by the city governments and not more than 20 percent is actually being treated. So what is happening to the remaining 80 percent of the waste? it is actually dumped in uncontrolled manner in the dump sites. So that's why the reason is that globally, it's not only in India, but globally there are almost 50,000 dump sites. And if you look at the data, which, is, which was uh, generated by the International Solid Waste Management Association in the year 2015, so you would see that the percentage population of these countries like in South Asia, 90% of the population 
does not have any access to regular waste collection and disposal. So this is the system which we have not only in India but in most of the developing nations. And this is what has been happening in most of the dump sites. Now on the right side, I would like to talk more about that right side picture. It is the Ghazipur dump site last year. And the white clouds which you can see is actually the smoke which is coming up from the waste and it is on its own. So this is the actual problem which we are having and the main problem with the burning of the waste is the generation of the methane gas which is uh, now the estimate says the kind of waste which is being dumped in our country around 35 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent of greenhouse gas is estimated to be produced from these dump sites on annual basis. And open burning has got its own um, affluent gases, which Ravi also mentioned in terms of smoke, black carbon, toxic fumes, and uh, low levels of dioxin and furons as well. Apart from air pollution, I would like to mention that these dump sites have got other environmental issues associated, which is in terms of the leachate wastewater, which gets generated, soil water contamination, vector bond diseases, odor, littering, etc. So now how should we address the issue? You close the dump sites. Quick solution. You create facilities for waste treatment because you don't want to send your organic matter or the recyclable products to the dump site. If you are not sending anything which is decomposable in nature to the dump site, then automatically there will be no production of any kind of landfill gas or the uh, greenhouse gas. And if there is no calorific value product which is sent to the dump site, then even if you try to burn it, there is nothing which can be burned. It's a simple sign. And you create sanitary landfill so that whatever remains are there from the processing facilities are put in a scientific manner so that it does not create any kind of harmful impact on the environment. These are some of the closure options which have been now looked upon uh, in the recent year, in the last one year, the government of India has also already taken some initiatives to encourage uh, the city governments to close their dump sites. And uh, they are also trying to provide some kind of uh, funds for them. But the main issue is that only those cities are going ahead with the closure of their dump sites where NGT has issued them a notice to do that. Otherwise, we, are, we, we go as business as usual scenario. But there are exceptional cases like Ghazipur where in spite of being issued the order to close the dump site immediately, they had to keep operating it because they did not have any alternative site. So if you look at the waste disposal option, then open dumping, why we do the open dumping? Simple thing because it is least cost effective and who cares for environmental benefit or technology. But if you are trying to close it, then of course it comes with some kind of cost. With flare, you try to flare the landfill gas or you try to utilize the waste, which is like the new terminology now is bio mining and land reclamation, then definitely it comes with cost. So any municipality which has got the capital investment related finance uh, label with it, they may go with this kind of technology. Otherwise, they'll keep on doing the open dumping. This is just one picture of Gorai before the closure and after closure. And post-closure, this was the first project of closure of the dump site and the uh, finance which they could get from it from the carbon uh, CDM benefits. First project in India which could claim the CDM benefit and utilize that money for closure of the dump site. And uh, post this, it is on the side of the coastal region, post that there was quite a good mangrove regeneration in that area. And the um, uh, real estate price also went up like anything once this site was closed. So, happy note. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the challenge is what we are having related to the closure of the dump site is enforcement of regulations. We have the regulations, but there is no proper enforcement. Poor governance. The ULBs, the city governments, they hardly have any technical or financial capacity to do such kind of work. And definitely lack of planning. I mean. If, even if the NGT has issued a notice to any city government to close its dump site, but if they do not have any alternate site, because the waste is something which is generated on daily basis, what do you do with that waste? So you have to have some alternate plan ready with you. So there is poor planning at the city government level, and that's why they are not being able to close their sites, and they are continuing with the business as usual scenario. And then. Even if the infrastructure is built for the cities, like compost plants or waste to energy plants or sanitary landfills are being built, then sustainability and operational issues are also there to take care of. 
because infrastructure for infrastructure uh, creation, government of India is also providing funds through this Swachh Bharat mission. But then to run it in, in a sustainable manner, the each and every city government, they need to create their own funds. So I can talk yeah. and talk about this <laughs> management, but uh, I think I have limited time, so <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm.